Well, once again, welcome home. Welcome to Discovery. Thank you, my bride. That's my bride. That's my bride. If it's your first time with us, I want to invite you to take out the connect card that you were handed on the way in and begin to fill it out. The best way we know to connect with you is through that card. And so would you take a moment and would you fill that connect card out? If you'd rather fill a digital version out, scan the seat back in front of you, scan the seat back in front of you, and you can complete the digital connect card. If you're online with us, there's a link in the comment section. Just click on that link and you'll be able to fill out the digital connect card in that area. Uh, on the bottom of the Connect card is an uh, area for prayer, and we want to come alongside of you, and we want to pray with you, whatever is going on in your life. Uh, we want to uh, be able to come alongside and encourage through prayer, and so would you let us know how we can pray for you? We're in this teaching series titled Stories of Faith, Stories of Faith, and so I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 8, turn to Matthew chapter 8. If you need a printed copy of God's Word, we have some in the back. We'd love for you to take one uh, and own it and, of course, read it. Matthew chapter 8, we're going to begin in verse 23. And the main idea that we're pressing in on today is that Jesus holds all authority. Jesus holds all authority. Now, when we look at this text and we consider Jesus, we've already witnessed uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as Matthew pins uh, the accounts of Jesus, Jesus walking on this earth, Jesus sitting on the Sermon on the Mount with the Sermon on the Mount, that side of the mountain, uh, and, and teaching sitting in the place of authority and teaching in chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. We've already witnessed different stories of faith, Jesus in his power and authority. And then we come to verse 23, verse 23. As he got up, got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Suddenly a violent storm arose on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves but Jesus kept sleeping. But Jesus kept sleeping. As he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. What is it for you and I to follow Jesus? Oftentimes we want to know the plans. We want a plan of action before we commit to anything. Am I speaking to anybody in the house today? I mean, we want to know, like, give me the schedule, and uh, if I agree, then I'll, you know, commit. Uh, but in this moment, the disciples, they didn't know what they were committing to when Jesus said, come and follow me. They left everything to follow him. And so in this moment, they've witnessed Jesus perform miracle after miracle. We've, we've read those accounts. We've studied those stories of faith. But then we come to this story. Jesus has already instructed the disciples to get into the boat. He gets into the boat. And what does the text say? His disciples followed him. Would we follow Jesus knowing a storm is coming? And for most of us, we're like, no, nah, I'm good. I'll like wait for the storm to pass. Then I'll follow Jesus. Because we want this kind of soft, easy kind of life. We don't want the pain. I, I mean, uh, anyone in their right mind tries to avoid pain on a daily. You, you, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, you look at people that are like always running to the most painful, hard moments of life, and you think they're crazy. But there's something about the pain of life. There is always purpose in, in the pain. This is something the Lord's really been uh, speaking to, to me. We can't avoid the pain the disasters, the tragedy. But if we knew that they were coming, if we knew what we were about to step into as we followed Jesus, most of us would never get into the boat. But the disciples follow Jesus into the boat. They get into the boat. I've heard all my life that the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Have you, have you heard that? And I agree that the safest place to be is in the center of God's will because the beauty of following Jesus, even in the most challenging, even if it means death, there is life for the believer, amen? And so either way, however 
this thing shakes, I'm good. But when we consider the safest place, and then we consider the disciples that follow Jesus, we know how their, their stories ended, right? I mean, when we study church history, when we just study the, the book of Acts, we see time and time again, they were met with beatings and stoning and prison floggings. Does that sound good to anybody? No, like most of us would, uh, you know, I'm good. I'm good. I'll stay back, right? But when this great wave of persecution had come upon the early church, they all faced significant challenges, danger, toil, persecution, and ultimately death in following Jesus. So another question to consider is what harm might come to you that our sovereign Lord has not already authorized? In following Jesus, in living this life of faith, what harm might come to you that our sovereign Lord has not already authorized? Because Jesus holds all authority. Suddenly, verse 24, a violent storm arose on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but Jesus kept sleeping. Now, in the, in, in the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee is much like a bowl. It's much like a bowl. There's a mountainous terrain uh, surrounding the Sea of Galilee. It's, 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 a, it's a beautiful sight. Uh, and each year when we take tours, we, we walk people through the Holy Land. We take a boat ride into the middle of the Sea of Galilee and they turn the engine off and we just have a moment with the Lord. And it's, it's pretty surreal to, to pause and consider all the, the earthly ministry of Jesus and all the miracles that Jesus performed all around this region in, in complete silence. And you look around and see the beauty of the mountainous terrain. But what most people don't understand is in the, even in the beauty of that, even in the calm, out of nowhere, winds can come right over the mountainside and hit the Sea of Galilee. And what is calm turns violent in just a matter of uh, hardly any time. And that's what these disciples are experiencing. They follow Jesus into the boat. There's a violent storm. There's waves. And wins, but Jesus kept sleeping. What a dramatic contrast. The violence of what's happening around this boat, but yet the peace and calm within the boat, at least for Jesus, as he's sleeping. Sleeping through it all. Jesus kept sleeping. I believe that we're impressed by the fact that, firstly, Jesus needed sleep. And what does this do? This shows his, his true humanity. All these miracles, he's been ministering, he's tired, he's worn out, but he's paused on this boat and he's sleeping. It shows his true humanity. But we're also impressed by the fact that he could sleep, right? We're, we're impressed by the fact that not only that he is sleeping, but, but uh, needed sleep, but that he could sleep when all of this is happening around him. And so the disciples, verse 25, came and woke him up saying, Lord, save us. We're going to die. Lord, save us. We're going to die. Now, do you recall in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus calls four men, and they are fishing. This was their vocation. They were experienced men. Uh, they would have experienced storms on the Sea of Galilee. I mean, and for them to have this kind of response, it just uh, is intriguing to me. That with all their experience, they... Begin to fear. What causes you and I to lose faith and to fear does not even begin to cause our Savior to fret. When we consider the text before us, the violence of the surroundings, the winds and the waves, 
outside of the boat and the waves crashing into the boat. Here Jesus is sleeping. He's sleeping. The disciples respond with fear and they lose faith. But Jesus is sleeping. Again, what causes you and I to to lose faith? You, You remember that last situation? I mean, leading up to that situation, you were, you were fired up. I mean, you were all about it, man, all about that life of faith, living for him. The Lord Jesus was your number one priority. And then the moment the storms began to, to shake you up a little bit, what was your response? God, where are you? God, God, where are you? We're much like the disciples. Jesus is in the boat, sleeping. They had just seen Jesus perform significant miracles. We've studied those stories of faith. They've seen Jesus with just one touch heal. They've seen Jesus with just one word heal. They've seen Jesus with great power and great authority do these significant miracles and Jesus is in the boat with them. But what is their response? They begin to lose faith. His peace, as Jesus sleeps in that boat, should have been their peace. Some of you are in the middle of a storm of life. Some of you are just exiting the storm. And then the third The third party here is you're about to enter the storm. (laughs) This is life. This is the brokenness of this world. This is the sinful state of humanity. And and so you're, you're in one of those three categories, whether you like it or not. But what a great encouragement to us today as we see this story unfold. That there is no storm. That Jesus is not present. The storms are raging all around. Jesus is sleeping in peace. He's present. How often, uh, how often we are quick to lose faith. I mean, isn't this us? How often are we so quick to lose faith? And so the question is, will you have faith in Jesus? Not in yourself, not in your own works. No matter how strong you think. I think you are, but will you have faith in Jesus in the middle of the storm? Because Jesus holds all authority. Verse 26, he said to them, he wakes up and notice what he says. Why are you afraid? You have little faith. Why are you afraid? You of little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. I mean, I, I just, I'm a visual person. I could only imagine Jesus. I mean, he is sleeping. And from the, from the story, from the text before us, I mean, it is one of those good sleeps. You know what I'm talking about? Those good sleeps. Y'all like, some of y'all hoping for that good sleep this afternoon, you know, Sunday afternoon nap. Uh, hopefully not yet. Uh, you'll wait 30 minutes. But, uh, you know, you're looking for that good sleep. Jesus is having one of those good sleep moments I wish I could see his face as he wakes up. And what does he say? Why are you afraid? Like I'm in the boat. I'm right here. I haven't gone anywhere. Why are you afraid? You have a little faith. Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Psalm chapter 89, verse 8. Would you write this reference down? Psalm 89, verse 8. It says, Lord God of armies, who is strong like you, Lord? Who is strong like you, Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging sea. When its waves surge, you still them. I mean, have we lost sight of how powerful our God is? Who is strong like you, the psalmist says. Your faithfulness, your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging sea when its waves surge. You alone still them. Verse 27, the men were amazed. They were astonished and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea 
obey him. Interesting response from the disciples after Jesus calms the sea. What kind of man is this? Church, may we never lose sight of how powerful our God is. May we never lose sight of how good our God is. May we never lose sight that our God is the provider. Whatever your need is, he is able. Would you believe that in faith today? In the span of a few moments, the disciples saw both the complete humanity of Jesus. That's Jesus in his tired sleep. And, and then they saw uh, the, the, the fullness of his deity. That only Jesus could calm the raging sea. Could speak these words and the seas level out. They saw Jesus for who he is. Truly man and truly God. Look to verse 28. Look to verse 28. When he had come to the other side, to the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him as they came out of the tombs. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. Pretty exciting moment. <laughs> I mean, the disciples just went from scared to death on the sea, and I wonder what kind of thoughts they, they were thinking as they saw these two demon-possessed men, you know? Like, oh, keep it together, keep it together. Jesus just rebuked me, man. You know, I, I don't know. I would have loved to see that response. But no one else wanted to go around these two demon-possessed men. But here's their first encounter. When he had come to the other side. Now we see this instruction in verse 18, Matthew 8, verse 18. When Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave the order to go to the other side. What's the other side? What's the other side? The other side would have been the, 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 the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. It would have been the region where the, the Gentiles uh, lived. It, it would be non-Jewish on this other side. So when Jesus refers to the other side, he's referring to the other side of the lake, the, the eastern side. And we're going to see there's evidence upon evidence that uh, non-Jewish people would, would rarely visit the other side side of this Sea of Galilee. He'd come to the region, the Gadarenes. Now, this past April, I visited uh, Israel. Many of you know, I, I went with a small group of pastors. It was a last minute trip put together by the Department of Tourism. And the, uh, it was a solidarity tour. And so we visited some sites, we uh, prayed, we spoke with locals, we met with the Department of Tourism, and we went to a few sites that I had not previously visited. And one of those sites is called Kersi. And in the Greek, Kersi means curse. Kersi means curse, and Kersi is uh, an archaeological site located on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, containing the ruins of the Byzantine monastery. And this site of Kersi is a site that tradition uh, has, has given uh, for the miracle that is before us, Jesus and the miracle of the swine. Uh, the settlement of Kersi was founded at the end of the 5th century for those that were on a pilgrimage to come and to visit this site where this historical and biblical story unfolded pilgrims would come and they would visit this site the site was severely damaged during the early part of the seventh century through the persian invasion and again through the muslim conquest then in the eighth century kersey was completely abandoned the eighth century kersey completely abandoned and then in 1980, 1980, the National Parks Authority began to excavate and reconstruct the original monastery and begin to put this, this settlement back together for us to see today. There's a few pictures I took while I was there knowing that this, this story was coming. That's the entrance, uh, a, a small little sign. Uh, that's why you came today. And, and so, um, but this is the monastery that's been reconstructed, in Byzantine monastery in the 5th century. And you can go to the next. This settlement, uh, 
They wanted to contain everything. They want to be self-sustaining at this monastery. And so this was a, an olive press, an ancient olive press that they've found. Um, then the next is, uh, should be a mosaic floor from the uh, chapel area. This was a mosaic floor, original mosaic floor from the 5th century. And, and then this view here, I want, you to, I want you to see this with me. This is a view of the chapel. And then through the, through the arches, you see a hill. Do you see the hill behind you? And in that hill, still till today, there are tombs in that hill. Now, this is the site of Kersey. And just beyond that hill is ancient Hippos. Ancient Hippos is one of the Decapolis, one of the 10 pagan cities in Jesus' time, one of the 10 major Roman cities in Jesus' time. All of this is going to connect as we continue to read this story, but, but I want you to see this for your, yourself with the hill behind it and the tombs contained in the hills behind. Look to verse 29, suddenly they shouted, what do you have to do with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? These two demon-possessed men ask Jesus two questions. Notice the first. What do you have to do with us, son of God? Do you see how they reference Jesus? They know there's something about him. They know that who Jesus is. They know the power and authority of Jesus. The demons knew who Jesus was, even if the disciples didn't. Why do I say that? I, I mean, after Jesus rebukes the disciples and calms the sea, what is their response? What kind of man is this? And then they get to the other side, to this, to this region, to this area. And they're confronted by these two demon-possessed men that live in the tombs, that have come out of the tombs. And you might ask, why, why tombs? Why tombs? Uh, there's multiple reasons. Because graveyards and, and the dead were, were terribly unclean and offensive to the Jewish people. Second, because demons love death. Because tombs made the men more frightening to others. They just come out of the tombs. They meet Jesus and the disciples. And they ask, what do you have to do with us, son of God? And James chapter 2 verse 19 says, you believe that God is one good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Even the demons believe and they tremble before God. If the demons tremble before him, what should our response be? To have this such a reverence, such an awe about how great our God is. But sadly, we've begun to reduce him. Demons believe and they shudder. And so they reference Jesus as the son of God. Interesting. Second question. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Do you see this question? Well, what kind of question is this? Have you come here to torment us before the time? That causes me to ask another question. What time? What time are these demons referring to? And, and it's the time appointed for the torment of evil powers. That's the time. Notice the question again. Have you come here to torment us before the time? I mean, the demons know. They know what, what to expect. They know what's coming. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Write this reference down. Jesus says, Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. A demons, the demons are admitting that a time is set for their torment. They know they are doomed. <laughs> They do not fight in hope of victory. They fight to drag as many down with them as they can. 
Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Would you write that reference down? Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The demons know how the story ends. It ends in death. It ends in destruction. It ends with eternal fire. Praise God. You and I as the church, we also know how the story ends. It ends with life. It ends with life. And so we better be a people of hope. There is victory in Christ Jesus. Demons know that Christ will be the one to cast them into torment in the end. They recognize him and cry out, it's not, it's not time yet. You're, you're early. Why are you here before the time? Do you see it? Demons not only know they are doomed, they, they know who will most certainly defeat them. And it is the Lord, our God. It is Jesus Christ alone. And they fear him. They fear him. Verse 30. A long way off from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. If you drive us out, the demons begged him, send us into the herd of pigs. A long way off from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. If you drive us out, the demons begged him, send us into the herd of, of pigs. D do you see the question again? They had to have known the authority of Jesus. By the way, they, they questioned him. Verse 32, look at Jesus' response. Go. It's one word. Jesus holds all authority. He responds with one word, go. Do, do you recall when the, the multitudes in Capernaum came to him for, for healing. And in verse 16, it was also with a word. One word. One word. Jesus, listen church, Jesus holds all authority. He says, go, he told them. So when they came, uh, had come out, they entered the pigs and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the water. Then the men who tended them fled. Pause for a moment. I want to take us back to that, that visual. As we see this, this sight of what is known today to us as Kersey, with the mountainside and the tombs in the background, and then just three miles away, just three miles away is, is, is Hippos. In this Gentile area, this non-Jewish area, there's large herds of, of pigs. Now, you and I, mo most of us are like, get excited about that, right? Because we know we equate pigs with bacon, and it's all good. It's all good. And I just praise God, by the way. I just want a praise moment. Can we just take a praise moment? Praise God. Uh, Part of the salvation, the blessings of salvation and the new covenant is uh, we're allowed to eat. You know, we're allowed to eat bacon. And, uh, and so at least in our household, that's a great thing. And we praise God for his many, his abundant blessings, you know, uh, like salvation and bacon. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, of course, salvation first. All right. Ch theology check. OK. And, and but, but but praise God, man, there's there's bacon. But but these people would have equated the herd of bacon with an income. I mean, that was their vocation. That's how they made money. And so what does Jesus do with all authority, with one word? He says, go. And the demons leave, enter the herds of pigs, cursey, set on the side of the Sea of Galilee. They run off to the Sea of Galilee. Their lives are over. And the people run back to the city. Cursey would not have been the city. The only possible with the archaeological evidence would be hippos. The, the people would have run back to the, to the city. And they went into the city, verse 33. And reported everything. Especially 
what had happened to those who were demon possessed. At that, the whole town went out to meet Jesus. Man, we would get excited about that, right? Look what Jesus has just done. Praise be his name. But sadly, this story doesn't end quite like that. When they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. What an opportunity for people to accept Jesus, but rather they rejected him. I don't know where you stand today. Those in the house, those online. But as we read through this inspired word of God, what we see from the beginning is God pursuing humanity with his unconditional love and creating a way And Jesus would be the only way. As we continue studying through Matthew, we'll get to the end. But many of you know how it is. That our Savior would be crucified on a Roman cross. And that his blood would, would shed because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And that our Savior... His body would be taken off of that cross and would be laid in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, just as the prophets foretold, he would rise victorious from the grave, conquering death, conquering sin, so that you and I could be made right only by his precious blood. Now, I don't know where you stand with the Lord today, but here's my encouragement. If you've been rejecting today, could be the day of salvation would you accept him the greatest gift these these men were, would rather have earthly riches than eternal rewards why else did they reject him what why else did they come out to see him and then beg him to leave their region he just destroyed this like stream of income <laughs> All that money, all that money went off the side of the the mountain into the the Sea of Galilee. And these men would rather have earthly riches than eternal rewards. I don't know what you're living for today. I don't know the pursuit of your life. I don't know the priorities in your life. But can I just encourage you to make Jesus the number one priority today? Allow Jesus to be your number one satisfaction. Allow Jesus to be your number one affection. Stop rejecting him and accept him. Live for him. Live a life of faith for him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? Online, would you do the same just for a moment? Would you just get along with with God and would you just would you just say Lord what is my response from all of this what is my response from all of this some of you know your response already perhaps there's some living today with fear and and, and, and some that maybe you've lost faith and some that have never surrendered over to him as, as Lord and Savior. Uh, some that have strayed off the path and, and today would be the day that you come home. I don't know how the Spirit of God is moving in your life, but, but here's my encouragement. If you sense the Spirit of God moving in your life, hey, surrender, surrender. Don't delay. Don't say, I'll get, my, I'll get it all together next, next uh, week or I'll get it all together next month. No, No, surrender now. Surrender now. Whatever it is, whatever burden, would you surrender it over to him? Thankful for the promise. Cast all our cares on him for he cares for us. Hey, would you release control? Would you release control? power would you release authority 
Jesus holds it all. Stop trying. Surrender it today. If there's one here today that's never, never surrendered over to Jesus for salvation, would you call upon the name of the Lord? On the authority of scripture, would you confess that Jesus is Lord? He's master. He's boss from this day forward. Would you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Would you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Jesus walked this earth, died on a cross, was placed in a grave and rose victorious. Would you believe? And, and then would you surrender it all? Lord Jesus, I'll follow you all the days of my life. I'll follow you all the days of my life. I trust you. My faith is in you. Lastly, would you thank him for, for his salvation? Would you, would you thank him for saving you? Giving you of all your sins. Acknowledging that he is the savior. You are the sinner. There's only one way to heaven. Through Christ Jesus our Lord.